So my wife, Sarah, I think she's in the nursery right now. She should be here soon. Um, She loves flowers. I would say that most women probably love flowers. I would also say most men also love flowers. We're just too prideful to admit it. So flowers for everyone. Um, the f- <laughs> also, th- this is your fourth reminder today. Next week is what? Mother's. Mother's Day. Okay, so this is all related. Flowers, buying flowers. My wife especially likes carnations. Like of all the flowers you could choose, carnations are her Yeah, carnations are absolutely her favorite. Why? Because they're (laughs) hardy. They last a long time. They've like got, like if you look at the stem of a carnation, it's like a thick straw. It's like just for sucking up nutrients. It's, It's great. They last forever. She loves them. So if I were to purchase a bouquet of carnations for my wife for Mother's Day because she's a mom, which of these should I buy? Should I buy A? Or should I buy B? B. Interesting. So I'm predominantly heard, I predominantly heard B, and you're all wrong. <laughs> you're all wrong. A. The answer is A. As I, when I go to Costco this week to buy flowers for my wife, here she is, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> I'm gonna. She knows it's coming. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, and I'm going to buy A, because I know my wife, and she prefers buds. She prefers flowers when they're young, when they're fresh. When the, Honestly, the more it looks like a weed at first, the better. Why? Because she likes them to last a long time. And so what I do is I will go to Costco, because that's where I buy flowers. They have good flowers there. I'll go to Costco, and I will ask the guy at Costco. I'll be like, hey. Like, I'll look at the carnations, and I'll say, all right, these are a little too bloomy. These look too nice right now. I'll go to the guy, and I will say, hey, you got any of the good stuff? (laughs) (laughs) Got Got any of those buds? Should I, I probably should have said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> How do you guys understand what that means? Okay, I had to pray about that one. And I thought it was worth it. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> and I buy her the youngest flowers that I can. Because I know that's what she likes. I know that's what she wants. Now, if I were to go to the store and I, if I were to buy her fully bloomed flowers, would she be mad at me? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, she wouldn't. She wouldn't be mad at me because, you know, I still got her something. It's still nice. But she wouldn't be delighted in them. She wouldn't take delight in the flowers I bought for her because I know that she likes buds. And she knows that I know that she likes buds. I should have chosen a different word. So when I buy flowers for Sarah, I purposely get those. Because I want to give her my best. I don't want to just give her, like, just good enough. I want her to know that I tried my best, and I want her to delight in them. I want her to know that I love her, that I adore her. But I take delight in her, and I make her very uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> uh, and that she's worthy of the best. So today, I'm, we're looking at a story in the Bible about two brothers and two gifts, and how one brother gave his best. Please turn your Bibles to Genesis 4, verse 2. Second part of verse 2. Genesis 4, verse 2, says, When the brothers grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. He was a farmer. When it came time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a, as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The best portions. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Abel. He did not accept Cain 
and his gift. And so my question for you guys is, why did God accept Cain's or Abel's offering and not Cain's? Why do you think? Because they both, they both offered something good to God. This isn't like my Sunday school picture that I colored when I was six that showed Abel bringing this lovely, beautiful, spotless lamb to the Lord, and then Cain coming in with like a bag of rotten apples, like dragging it in. You can see the flies, the smelling. That's not what Cain did. In fact, I would say Cain offered something that was, that was, good, to, that was good. He offered some of his crop to the Lord, but... But Cain gave a good gift, but Abel gave his best. Abel gave his best. Because if you look at the text, you can see it says that Abel gave the best portions. It says that he gave the fatty parts of his of his flock, of his lambs, of not only just like not just the best part of a lamb. He gave the best part of the firstborn of his lambs. So he took the best of the best, of the best, and gave that to the Lord as an offering. When it speaks of Cain, it just says, Cain gave some of his crops. And I think here where the Bible is a little bit silent, that silence speaks volumes about Abel's heart and how much he gave, and Cain's heart and how it seems he did not give his best to the Lord. Cain just gave some of his crop. Nothing remarkable, solid C minus. <laughs> but how did Abel know to give these portions? These fat, meaty portions. These portions, these were like wagyu, wagyu, um, beef. You, have you ever seen that? They're, they sell it at Costco. It's way above everyone's pay grade. It's $99 a pound. And it's like this beautifully marbled, fat portion of meat. They only carry two of them at Costco at a time because nobody buys them, I assume. (laughs) It's my dream to have one of these, but I don't think I ever will. I don't think I ever will. He offered that to God. It's like the best of the best of the best. But how how did Abel know to give those portions? And how did he know that God would accept them? He didn't. He didn't know. Because where we are in the Bible, this is Genesis chapter 4. This is the first book of the Bible, chapter 4. There's only been two pages before this, right? There's no conversation of God speaking to Cain, God speaking to Abel, that's recorded anyway, of saying, this is what I want. Please bring me this. That happens later in the story. So what Abel did is Abel, without God prompting him, he looked at what he had, and he said this. This is the best. This is the part that I would want to eat, maybe. And because it is the best, I am going to give it to my Lord. I'm going to present it as an, as an offering to my Lord simply because it is the best and simply because he is worthy. Because he is worthy of my best. Tremendous faith. I don't even know how God will respond to this. But I am not going to hold anything back from my maker. Sometimes we approach life in kind of a modest, cautious um, behavior. Like, I'm only going to give so much because I'm afraid of being ripped off. I'm afraid of giving too much. Then I've given too much of myself away. And then I feel like I've been ripped off. Abel says, I am all in everything that I have, the best that I have. I am giving it away to the Lord. All in, he gave his best. And I believe in that moment as he gave his best, God looked into his heart and knew, this is a man who honors me. This is a man who honors me and says, I am worthy of his best. What great, courageous faith. Courageous faith. And God not only accepts Abel's offering, the text says God accepts him. It doesn't just accept what he gave. God looks to this man and says, I say yes to you. You are good. What you have done is good, and that gives me such an indication of who you are as a person. And we see that in Hebrews 11 11 verse 4. 
Hebrews 11, verse 4. This is the Hall of Faith chapter that we're going through a series on now. 11, verse 4, it says, It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. It proved his righteousness. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by the example of his faith. He still speaks to us by the example of his faith. And my question to you is, what does your faith say about your life? What, if we were to take a look at your life and how you have shown faith to the Lord, what does it say about you? Will it count you? Is it evidence of your righteousness? Does it say you're in good standing with the Lord? Or does it beg the question, does she even have faith? Does he even have faith? Wow. Last week, Pastor Garen defined faith as belief, trust, and commitment to obey. And so I want to take a couple minutes and I want to look at this story through those lenses. Belief, trust, and commitment to obey. And I think if we do, we can see very clearly that there is a big difference in the level of faith and commitment to the Lord between the two brothers, Cain and Abel. And we also can gain some, in, some insight into where our faith falls on this spectrum of faith versus unbelief. So I'm going to read you some statements corresponding to belief, trust, and commitment to obey. What I want you guys to do is really give me your brain for a few minutes. Really give it to me. Really pay attention. I want you to listen to these statements, and I want you to decide in your heart of hearts which brother am I more like. Which thought pattern does my, do my thoughts normally follow, and which do, do I not? And I think we're all going to be surprised at how much this applies to us and applies to what we're willing to give to the Lord. All right, so number one, belief. Abel would say, I believe God is real, and I believe that God is worthy of my best. We see that because he actually gave God his best. Cain would say, I believe God is real, because you know it says in the Bible, he was walking and talking with God, not hard. I believe God is real, but I am not sure he's worthy of my best. I'm not positive that God is good. And I want you to take a second in your head, which one most resonates with you? Cain or Abel? I think so many of us are like Cain. So many, and I've had so many conversations with people who are like Cain in their belief toward the Lord. I think it's very easy to believe that God is real. In fact, um, they say, studies say that the act, true atheism, like actually believing God does not exist, I'm a firm believer, that's dying out. People don't believe that as much as they did 10 years ago because more and more evidence comes out that proves God's existence every single day. If you want to hear more about that, talk to Larry about it. <laughs> but it's true. To truly not say, I do not believe in God at all, that's actually very rare nowadays. It even says in the Bible that even the demons believe in God, and they shudder. So that doesn't, that's not enough to, to give you faith. It's not enough. Most of you believe God is real, but you harbor doubts about his character. Is he really good? Is he really worthy of my best? Is he worthy of my time? Is he worthy of my talents? And is he worthy of my treasure, my earthly finances? Is he worthy of those things? And my answer to you, in one word, is yes. 100% yes. Let's just look at Cain's life. All that Cain knew about God, at least he did know this, but maybe it wasn't all he knew, but what he knew about God was God was his maker. From nothing, out of nothing, God formed him together in his mother's womb. He was literally the first person who was ever made in a womb. Okay, Adam and Eve were created from the dirt and from a rib. 
Cain was the first person made of two people coming together and making a child. He knew that God made me. God formed me through that. God breathed life into me as he breathed life into all of you. And he sustains my very essence. Every breath I take is because of what he has done for me. Every step I take is because of what he has done for me. And that is proof enough of that he is worthy of being praised. He is the potter. We are the clay. He has formed us and has the right to do with us whatever he wants. But if you want more proof, fast forward thousands of years to Jesus on the cross. If you want real proof that Jesus was good, see what he did for you on the cross. Jesus, who was himself God, clothed himself in flesh because he wasn't able to die as God. He took on attributes as a, of a man, clothed himself in flesh so he could die for you because you have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God said, we have to fix this. And so I'm going to sacrifice everything. I'm going to give you absolutely everything, my life, my essence. I'm going to pay it all and die a criminal's death on a cross for you. And that is why God is good. God doesn't need to prove to you that he is good. He already has. He already has when he died, died for you on the cross. And so here, it's not really an issue about God's character if you don't believe God is good. It's an issue of your faith. It's an issue of your faith. Because really what it comes down to, if we want to get really technical, is that if you don't believe God is good, then you must not also believe that he died for you. And if you don't believe that God died for you, you have no foundation to build your faith on. That's what we say when we do the prayer. We believe you died for us. You cover our sin with your blood, and we are saved. So it is impossible to have faith if you do not believe that God is good. Amen? All right, that was a hard one. All right, that's belief. Let's go to trust. Trust. Abel would say, I trust that when, God, when I give God my best, God will continue to provide for me. I trust that I won't lack anything. Because look, he gave that beautiful piece of, that, that, that beautiful meat. I don't know how much he had. The part that I love about it is he gave the, first, the best portion of the first of his flocks. Maybe he didn't know any more were coming. This was the first. And he says, I'm giving that part to God. Because I believe, I trust that God will continue to provide for me even if, I can, even if I give him my absolute best. I trust that I won't lack anything. Cain would say, I have doubts that if I gave God my best, God would still provide for me. That I would have enough. I'm afraid of not having enough. It terrifies me. So many times we're like Cain. We're afraid of giving God our best because we're worried we won't have enough. We're worried we won't be able to make ends meet. And that's real for a lot of you, even in this room. We're afraid of giving God our absolute best because we're not even sure how we're going to make it through the month. That's absolutely true. And we say in generosity time almost every week, put your trust in him. We have never, the Bible says, I have never seen a righteous man begging for bread. If you give to the Lord, he will give you back tenfold. Maybe it's, not, maybe it's not in incredible riches, but it's in a rich and satisfying life. You know, you will always have enough. My family has experienced that. Anyone who says, Leon's in the back going, me, me, me. Anyone who is faithfully tithed will always say, the Lord has blessed me beyond measure for my giving. It's true. I've never seen someone who has regretted doing it. But I also think more often than that, because I don't want to discount, there are people who are truly struggling. More often than that, we're afraid of giving God our best because we're worried we won't be able to live our best life. We don't want to give our God our best of our time, of our talents, and our treasure because there's other priorities in our lives, right? We don't want to spend time with God. You know, you say to God, God, I just don't think I have time to spend with you right now, reading my Bible, praying, going to church. I just, 
Work killed me last week. I'm just beat. I can't do, I can't, I just, I need to sit down. Like, this is my Netflix time. New episode of whatever is on. This is me time. I got to refresh, refill myself. Sorry, God, I can't take 10 minutes and spend with you. Right? We're afraid to give to the Lord because of all the stuff we want to buy. How many of you have the new iPhone? Don't raise your hand and you do not need it. <laughs> Pause for a second. Pause the sermon. Maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. I'm in doubt. I'm in doubt. Never mind. I already said, I already said one questionable thing today. Talk to me after class. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt myself. I don't doubt God. <laughs> All right. How many of you are afraid to serve the Lord because you feel like I've got other stuff I want to do? I take you know two, three trips on weekends are my day for the, are my time for trips. I go to the, I go camping. I go to the park. I go hang out with my kids or whatever. I can't I can't sacrifice an hour and a half on Sunday to serve. Let alone go to church. Let alone to serve. Guys, we have it backwards. We have it so backwards. Because what I have learned is that when you spend time with God, he gives you true peace. There are times where I really, I just come home and I just, all I want to do is watch TV or play video games or something. But if I spend some time, not even, you know, I could spend three hours watching a show and I spend 15 minutes reading my Bible I feel so refreshed just from that 15 minutes. He gives me true relaxation. He gives me true rest. He gives me true peace when I spend time with him. When I give to him, I know he's going to provide everything that I need. And when I serve, I know that he's going to provide me with friends to serve alongside. And he's going to provide me with purpose for my life. We as humans, we need purpose. That's why it's so important for us to serve in the church. It's because we are moving forward God's kingdom together. And that's why God calls us to do it together. He didn't want to do it himself. He wanted us to be his hands and feet. So he calls us all to give our best in service as well. Amen? And I have found, this is 100% true, take it to the bank, when you give God your best, you will be living your best life. You will. You will. All right, finally, commitment to obey. Faith is commitment to obey. Abel would say, I'm committed to obey God and give him my best, even if I am not rewarded or regarded by him. Because really, God didn't promise Abel anything. There's nothing that says, hey, if you give me a good sacrifice, I'm going to accept you. If you give me a good sacrifice, I'm going to reward you. Abel just did it in faith. He did it regardless of the consequences. Cain, on the other hand, would say, my obedience to God is dependent upon me being rewarded or regarded by him. When I am not rewarded and regarded, my faith is shaken, my belief wavers, my trust in him is lost. I lose faith that he's even good. I become angry at God and at people, and I fall into sin. And we see that in the passage. Look back to verse 4. Genesis 4, verse 5, actually. Second part. The Lord did not accept Cain in his gift, and this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. God said, why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. And here's salvation message, people. You will be, like Cain's life wasn't over. Like Cain didn't have just like one chance, okay? God said, you will be accepted if you do what is right. Implying Cain did something wrong by not giving God his best. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. For sin is crouching at the door, either to, eager to control you but you must subdue it and be its master. 
and then it just goes right into it. So one day, Cain suggested to his brother, hey, let's go out into the fields. And while we were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Because he was not accepted, but Abel was. Because he sinned and Abel was righteous, Cain just said, well, I'm just going to take him out. And we see where the path, where this path of distrust leads us. Faith leads us to righteousness. But distrust in, in God, it leads us down this deep path of sin that a lot of times there's no coming back from. Because if you doubt God is even good, if you doubt that he will provide for you, if you just refuse to obey him just because you're not getting stuff in return, your entire life starts being patterned after that. And you say, well, if God is not even good, why do I need to be good? If God's not going to continue to provide for me, I need to take it upon myself to make life better for me. And if God's not going to reward me for me being good, then why bother? I'm after it for myself, not giving glory, not giving honor to my maker. Oh, that's a dark path. That's a dark path, people. And yet it seems to me that a lot of us are right there. Right there. But praise be to God. There's forgiveness. Praise be to God that he has offered us a perfect example of faith through Jesus and through people in his, his word. Praise be to God that he has given us Christian community to raise each other up and build each other up so that we can walk together in this. Listen, I've fallen short on this too. I mean, look at like how much time I spend on Netflix. You can see, like, obviously I need to spend more time in my word even, right? But we need to pick each other up as people. Yeah pick each other up as brothers and sisters in Christ and support each other and look to God and have deep, deep, courageous faith in him. Courageous faith means going against the status quo, saying, I am going to serve God. I am going to give him my best simply because he's worthy. Simply because he's worthy. Yeah. Right now, my wife and I, we are looking for a house. And it's been kind of a discouraging process, to be perfectly honest. The market right now is absolutely wild, absolutely crazy. And we put in offer after offer after offer after offer. And it seems that every time, it's just like by a small amount, someone beats us. Or they decide, you know, I don't, I don't need an inspection on the house. And so they go with the people who don't want an inspection. We're like, why wouldn't you want to inspect the house you're going to live in for 30 years? But it just seems like everything is against us, right? And it's so easy in that moment after we've invested so much time, so much energy. Oh, my goodness. It's a nightmare. It's so easy to be frustrated and discouraged and even think to myself, like, God, what the heck? Like, what is going on? What are you doing? And right there, I'm like on the precipice of sinning. But here's the deal. And here's what I think God has been working through me in my life when I, as I've been writing this message and I've been studying this. And I know it's like, yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you write a, a sermon, you just have to like put, you have to take everything full blow, like a shotgun to your chest um, of everything God is doing to you. And it's just like the Lord has just been telling me over and over and over again, just trust in me. Every house that you've been beaten out on, I have been saving you from. I have been protecting you from that because I have something so much better for you. My purpose is not to kill and steal and destroy. That's the enemy. My purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. John 10.10, 10, you need to trust me, Christian. You need to trust me, Sarah, and we'll make it work out. And I will be so pleased. I will be so blessed. I will give God all the glory, all the honor, and everything if we get a house. But even if we don't, I will call his name blessed. I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
For it, my faith is not dependent upon my life getting better for me. My faith is dependent upon my maker and who he is, and he is good, and he is worthy just by the fact that he made me out of nothing. I am nothing to him, and yet I am everything to him. He loved me so much that he would die for me. He loved me so much that he would bring me into this fellowship of believers to help lead you alongside a pastor who loves you so much, a pastoral team who loves you so much. God is so good, and he is worthy of you giving him your best. He's worthy. So today I want to end by just asking you guys a question. Why don't you all stand to your feet? I just want to ask you guys a question. During this message, I've covered a lot of ground. And there's a lot of areas where I think the Spirit can call us into and say, hey, I want you to take a step moving forward in your faith. Maybe it's trusting God with your time, committing to come more to church, committing to spend more time in your personal life with Jesus. Maybe it's committing your your talents to the Lord, saying, I'm going to serve the Lord with all that I have. Maybe it's committing your treasure to the Lord, saying, I'm going to trust God with my finances. I'm going to trust God with all my material possessions and say, I know you're going to provide for me no matter what. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you raise your hand if you feel the Spirit is leading you to move forward in one of those areas? I know it is for me. I know he is for me. Let's pray. Let's all pray together. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness where we have, we have said you are not worthy, even inadvertently, by withholding from you our best. And so, Lord, I ask that you would reveal to these people where you want to lead them. Reveal to them how they can give their best to you. And Lord, we commit, say, I commit commit. to following your leading. leading. And I commit commit to to giving God God my best, best. regardless of the consequences. consequences. Because we know you've got good stuff in store for us, Lord. We know you've got good stuff in store for us, Jesus. I pray you would bless your people with a rich and abundant life as they follow you, as they obey you, as they trust and have faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And then one final prayer. Maybe today is the day where you want to take a step and you want to say, today's the day where I say I want to believe in Jesus for the first time. Or maybe after this message, you've kind of questioned, am I even saved? I don't, you know what I mean? Maybe today is the day where you rededicate your life to to Jesus. Well, how do you do that? You turn from your sins, you turn to God, and you say, Lord, I want to follow you. You let him lead. So every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there anyone in this room or online who would like to put their faith in Jesus today? Like to say, I believe in you, Jesus. Would you raise your hand? Yeah, I see that hand, that hand. Yeah. Praise you, Jesus. All right. Church, let's all pray together. And if you're praying this for the first time or making a recommitment, remember, you're not speaking to me, you're speaking to the Lord. And he hears you. All right, repeat after me. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes and I ask forgiveness. Purify me by your blood. I turn to you, Jesus, and ask you to be my savior, to be my master, and I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. And the answer to that prayer is always yes. Yes and amen. All right. It was so good to see you guys today. Love you all. If you made a commitment to follow the Lord, just check on the uh, Connect card and let us know. And our ushers are coming right now. Those Connect cards that you've been filling out, would you just pass those towards the center aisle and uh, the, drop those in those buckets? Uh, yep, I see you're getting there. There, oh, Or hand it to them. There you go. Good job, everybody. You know, I just feel like it got real today. You know, it was like, wow, yeah, I can really see how this applies to life. Amen. And we are going to be walking in a different way. Amen. Let's not just come and just do the church thing and say, oh, that was really great and do keep living life the way we have. Let's be changed. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Let's have faith and trust God. Yeah. All right. Well, we're uh, going to get ready to dismiss, and tonight we have together nights, so we are going to be resetting this room. So if there are a few guys that can help us set up some tables and stack some chairs, we'd love for you to just kind of hang out in the front here, and I'm not sure who's going to make that happen, but someone will make it happen. And then next Sunday, what is it again? Mother's Day, yes, so come, ready to take pictures, celebrate moms, have something sweet. It's going to be awesome. We'll see you next week. God bless.